Glad to have everyone here. A uh, couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So Follett, obviously, is providing the space for us, and also they provided uh, the food for us this month as well. So big thanks to Follett. And for coming in for letting us in. Also, uh, next month, we do have short talks. So if you're interested in giving a two to 10 minute talk, let one of us know, so myself, Grant, or Michael, and we'll be added to the agenda for next month. Um, we do have an opening for July, so if you're interested or know someone who would like to talk, let us know as well. Um, the other thing that's going on is um, we are going to be talking to Shift Coworking, which is a new co-working space in Crystal Lake. Um, it's kind of between the two train stations. Uh, I think it's like an, an industrial park between the two train stations. So anyway. Um, so, I'm going to be going there, hopefully Rand can join me either Thursday morning or Friday morning to talk to them. So, we may have a future meeting there, so it could be as early as our June meeting. Um, so, what we're talking about doing is possibly having some meetings there and some meetings here. Um, so, my point is, pay attention to the announcement for next month, where the location is. Obviously, we'll, we'll broadcast that out if it changes, but, but keep an eye out for that. Um, and then the other thing I want to plug is our YouTube channel. So Rand has been doing an awesome job recording these meetings this year. So we have, I think, well, we have some older videos there, but even for this year, we have three or four videos up there. So our this year's videos are much higher quality than the past. So um, take a look at those if you missed a meeting. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to hand it over to Dave, and we'll get started. Okay. Thanks. get ready to docker. So who knows what docker is? Who's ever heard of it? Who's used it? Okay, so you heard of it? You played with it at all? Okay, so just trying to zoom in on who, who's doing what here. So uh, this is our agenda. This is not the right agenda, but it's close. Um, so we want to keep it simple. And what the, the goal of this talk is Docker for Dev. So how can using Docker help you as a developer in your everyday work? Um, so let's talk about Docker. Um, it's kind of a lightweight VM. So think of a VM. You have hardware at the bottom. You have a hardware layer. You have uh, operating system services. You have all this other stuff, and then at the top you have your application. Um, at the in a Docker VM, it doesn't deal with hardware; it deals with the system directly. There's no hardware layer. There's it's just a Linux, kind of a real thin Linux, um, v, uh, for want of a better word, VM running on top of a. Uh, uh, a, a Linux VM, and that's another interesting thing is right now it's only for Linux, although I think there's work on Windows, and they may already have it running, but it runs in a Windows v, or Linux VM anyway. Um, the idea behind Docker came from the LXC services, which were a bunch of Linux services that people used to create these big networks of, of isolated processes. Um, but you had to do it with a lot of scripting and things. So Docker makes it real easy to deploy individual services in by themselves, kind of isolated from each other. Um, so it allows you to package all your code and your configuration. Now, how many times have you installed something in a server and then had it, oh, this server doesn't have this configuration file on it. and oh, so we got to stop that and restart that. Oh, now we got to reinstall this package, but this binary is not compatible. So now we got to reinstall the VM. Way too much. This Docker thing, you just shove it in there and it works. So it, it's a huge, huge win for us. Um, so, oh, the, so Docker now, it started out as a Docker project. It's now a company Docker who are trying to sell things associated with it. Um, there's an open source project which is the upstream to Docker, which is Moby. So if you hear Moby anywhere, that's the open source project. 
Um, so let's talk about a Docker. There's two big concepts in Docker. There's an image and there's a container. Um, an image is a binary file, so just a big old thing. It's got a bunch of layers. Each one is assigned to SHA-1, and it's kind of, if you were to run a command on the console, you would say, okay, I do um, copy this file to that file. What is the delta? What has changed between those two those points in time? That becomes baked into a layer and then added to the stack. And then you keep doing stuff and adding layers, and then eventually you have this thing that kind of gets virtually flattened, and you end up with the stuff at the bottom, and then your application at the top. Um, typically, the public Docker images are deployed to hubdocker.com, that's now Docker Store or something. Um, but you can go and get these now, we'll look at some of them. The, so the image is the actual binary file itself. It defines what software is baked in, what, what software is there. You take one of those images and you run it and that becomes a container. So I think of it in terms of uh, like a Java class or something. So the image is the class. It defines what it can do. The container is I actually do a new on that class and I create an instance of it. Now I have an actual running thing uh, with memory, with processes, all kinds of stuff. So a little different than the class, but you get the idea. Um, so because a container is a running instance of an image, it has processes. I can see processes running in Docker containers from what we call the host machine. So the host machine is the machine that you're running these containers in. Um, I can see those processes running. If I'm inside the container, I can see the processes running, but they're different because the way, they're, the, way the um, Docker system works is all these processes are isolated. So PID number one inside the container may be PID 3500 on the outside. This is a huge thing, and you gotta keep that in mind because your user ID outside might relate to a different user ID inside or it might not be defined at all. Um, oh, I should mention, so our, I've been working on this Docker stuff for probably a couple years now. Uh, we started with uh, just running in Docker containers, so some of our systems are followed or deployed directly in containers into VMs. Uh, we got sick of managing those, so we decided to um, look into Kubernetes a year ago. And it's cool, but it had a lot of pieces that were missing, like access control and things. Uh, so we moved over to Redshift, Red, Red Hat's version of Kubernetes, which is OpenShift, which includes a lot of enterprise kind of stuff. Um, one thing that OpenShift does is it says, we'll run this container for you. But normally a Docker container, if I'm running from the my command line, which we'll see plenty of today, um, it runs as root, user ID zero, group zero. So if somehow your application that's running can break free of your C group, which is the thing that isolates you to all the other stuff, now I'm out running around with root permissions. And so in an enterprise system, this is not um, acceptable. So what they do is they launch all the containers with a completely arbitrary user ID, which has special requirements for the Docker images we built. Today we'll just be using the standard Docker. Won't be messing around too much with IDs, except at one point where we're gonna have to. Um, Another cool thing is that Docker running containers can be inspected. They can ask it questions about itself. I can ask you how much memory you're using, how much memory you allocated, uh, what, what are you running, what volumes are you sharing, we'll talk about volumes, uh, what image are you based on, and a bunch of IDs that get generated at runtime for statistical purposes. Um, so a running container, a running container if you shut down your machine with Docker on it, you start it back up, the Docker daemon will start and say, oh, this guy was running when I shut down, it will restart. So it's kind of a system D without being a system D. Um, the restarted container is basically the same as when you 
shut it down. It uses the same command line effectively. And then all the files created in the container. So this is item number two. Files in a Docker container are ephemeral. They go away. So if you run a, if you take an image, you run it, you create a container, <coughs> I create a file in there, I stop that container and remove it, and start a new one, those files are gone. In order to persist them outside of the container between multiple, multiple launches, um, you have to map them to an external storage of some sort, an NFS mount, luster FS mount, a machine, mount something, and there's, we'll see how to do that, because that's important when you're developing code. Um, one of the, so you're saying, well, I just keep this thing running all the time, and it'll never restart. Well, it will restart, and if you got stuff magic in there you're working on, you don't want it to restart and delete everything. Um, the uh, other thing is, say you want to update, so I run, I run a thing that says, I want to use Nginx version 3, and then they release version 4, and I just say, get Nginx, and now it replaces my old one. I kill the container and put the new one in, now all my files are gone. Oh, let's see. Blah, 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 okay. Um, <laughs> files are ephemeral, blah, blah, okay, we talked about that. Okay, so, forget this stuff, let's look at some code. Um, All right, everybody can see that. So, Docker PS, what's running? <coughs> so, uh, commands are roughly similar to Unix commands, so Docker PS is roughly the same as you'd expect as PS. Um, there's a lot of other ones, but Docker RN says remove a container. Uh, so then there's start and stop, so we can say Docker run. Can't type and look up there at the same time. Um, let's see. So we're gonna we're gonna run a container. I'm gonna say dash it. That is magic, and that connects your console to the console inside the Docker container. Um, then a bunch of other options, and now we say what image do I want to run? Yeah, let's do something boring and run CentOS seven. And then what do I want to run once I've created this container? By default, every container does something by itself, but you can say, I want to do something else. So, I am now running a Docker container with the CentOS 7 OS in it, and this number here, which you're wondering what that is, that's my host name. That's also a random ID, which is the container ID that's been assigned to this running image. Every container has a unique, it's basically a SHA-1 of something. Um, as with Git, the first few characters are usually good enough when you want to refer to it. <coughs> so let's look around. What do we got in here? It looks kind of like uh, a Linux system. If I cat Etsy Red Hat. Release it says 7.4. Fine. Um, interesting things to note. If I do um, it's got a wow, well, that's interesting. Comcast. Yeah, we Comcast I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a weird one. Oh, it's like a Comcast DNS. Yeah, it's got like yeah all, it is. all of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know where that came from, but I don't care that much. Um, probably because they use it at home in Wisconsin. Oh well, it still works. So what are you going to do? Um, so we're inside a we're inside a CentOS um, machine, basically. So the, the big things to keep in mind is you can have containers that are based on different OSs. So there's some that are based on CentOS. Very few, because CentOS seems to be a bit big. Um, Debian is used more often uh, for other containers. Then there's these really lightweight, like Mint and things like that, that get run, that get used for a lot of things. The idea is to make containers as thin as possible. If I have a thousand of these running in a, say, an OpenShift installation, which 
there's a lot of those kind of installations running. They're running thousands of containers. If I can shave a couple of uh, 100 meg off of each container, that's significant when I'm running a thousand containers. What happened when you typed Docker run? Um, so, there is a fine question. So let's look here. Oh, so here's another. We'll get back to that. Docker, when I'm inside a container, I don't see Docker. I'm isolated from the outside system, and unless I um, do some special stuff at startup, uh, I can't see anything else in the system. So I can't use a Docker image to build another Docker image. You can, but it's, it's tricky. Um, so let's switch over to our other. Clar. Okay, okay. Now let's do just look here. Okay. So we have two containers running. One of them is the CentOS 7. Let's look at Docker images. Oh, jeez. Let's open that up. So you're running a Linux VM as your host? Um, yeah, I, on your Windows laptop? I tend to do all my work in the Linux VM. So which which uh, Linux are you using? I just use for CentOS 7. For you know, the host? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the virtual box is actually running on the on the Windows host. Yeah. And then the, the yeah. And then CentOS is the guest in the VM. Okay, so these are a bunch of um, images that are stored in this box. So the interesting one that we just ran was this guy here, um, CentOS 7. So when I did Docker run, the first thing it does is it says, hey, let's um, look in my local Docker repository for a CentOS 7 image. And if it finds it, it'll say, it says, great. So if I do Docker pull CentOS 6, let's see if that works. So it, I don't have it locally, so it's going out to Docker Hub and pulling one of the open source um, images down. I don't know why you want to pull CentOS 6, but okay. Um, so you have a directory <coughs> on your local machine that has these multi hundred megabyte files sitting in it. Well, okay, this number you can take with a grain of salt. If, think of the cake, right? The cake is 10 layers thick, but you might share three of them at the bottom. So it's not always this big. There's usually some savings involved. But yeah, basically there's a cache of every image that you need to use in your local var, var live docker is the standard okay. place where files get stored. Um, so that is one thing that happens is especially on our Jenkins builds or whatever where we build these containers all the time they tend to fill up with docker images and you have to go in and clean them up. Um, recent versions of docker have added nice commands to do pruning where basically you can say get rid of everything, get rid of stuff that's not running, get rid of stuff that's not used by anybody else. Um, but so it's all sitting on your machine in some, in what, bar live docker. Yeah. And it's just stashed away somewhere. Right. It's right here in this box, and I am, now I'm going to do docker images again, and I will see that um, CentOS 6 is here, and that was released five weeks ago. So I could do the same thing with, um, let's see, docker run, T, CentOS. Okay, now here I am inside another CentOS machine. No, <coughs> oh. you didn't say CentOS six. So we ran the latest set CentOS. So you said. Oh, good. It explains why it didn't work anyway. Okay. Yay. Okay. So yes, there's a copy of each, each of these images on whatever, any machine that runs Docker has to have storage, local storage in these things. 
maybe that's not entirely true. You could probably use a RAM disk or something if you had enough memory, and if you're only running one or two containers on a certain machine, but in general, every 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 image has to be stored on the box. And when you run Docker commands, I'm assuming it's talking to some overlord that has its vendors and everything. There is a Docker daemon that is that is running. This comp, the Docker command line is talking to the daemon and making it do things. The daemon is running as root. It it can do pretty much everything. It has a lot of it has a lot of fingers into networking, um, it is very powerful. So I'm gonna kill this guy. Um, yeah, because if you do ifconfig, there is a whole gob of stuff. So a lot, of, a lot of networking gets set up to connect containers between to each other, and we'll talk, touch on that a little bit. But it's like here's my two ethernets, loop back, and then a bunch of these other ones. Oh, so, um, this is stuff you generally don't care about, and as you add and remove s s things, it'll stuff will fly up and go away. And it doesn't matter. Now you just you just exited out of the, the bash. Yes. Right. Now you want to get back into that again? Well, I can't because it's oh. well. Okay, so two things. I could so if I do ps a that says show me killed containers. So here is a kill CentOS 6 container, which I could say Docker start. So when we say kill, that means I ain't running anymore, right? Stop. I, stop. I suppose Did stopping it. might be a better word because killing yeah, implies kill it can stopping. never be resurrected. You know, it, it would stop is just like you're suspending it, basically. Mm -hmm. Sci fi kill. So now. Different levels you heard of killing the process. And Unix and different options for um, Oh, well, here. That's, that's actually. Uh, so let's see. Let's do Docker exec. So the, this is how you go into a running container. Um, I just need to know the container ID 64. Or I could use the name, which is Vibrant Newman. If I don't assign a name, it's, it's assigned for you. I'm going to run bash when I get in there. Now I'm okay. inside the container. Let's look at the processes. Um, so the thing that inside a container that's when it's running, must be running, is pin number one. Um, if I'm outside the container, that would be pin number n. Some number, it's just another system process. But the way the C groups and all the other stuff work is it kind of says, okay, well, your pit is one. If I do kill, let's see. Well, how about that? Well, looks like it didn't like pit one going away. But there's no init process, which was key for me at first. Yeah. Yeah, if you do a PS minus A here, you could do all the processes. So it is magic. Now there is, if, if we're running like a node server or something, you kill the nodes, the node service, the, the, the container just goes away and stops generally. So that's what I thought I was going to show. Okay, so we reincarnated a, we started a stop uh, container. Um, okay, CentOS 6 is still running. Let's do Docker stop 64. Hello. You pick that one. It's not liking that I killed them. Okay. And Docker. So now I talk about RM. RM says remove the dead container, the suspended container that's sitting on the disk and release the memory and storage and whatever. So we're going to do that. And now I have Docker PS A does not show that. It shows sent the one CentOS I created by mistake. So we're going to. Oh, and then I can also do rm-f, which says, eh, I don't care if it's running, kill it anyway. So, 
So now we have um, our CentOS 7 and Bash running. Um, this other, this other um, container that's running here is a real handy little utility called Portainer. Um, it's a GUI that runs in your Docker system, in your, on your box, and allows you to look at images, networks, volumes, you know, all kinds of stuff. So you're looking at that images here. I can go through here and like scroll through pages of them. And this is very handy. Especially if you got a lot of images, sometimes the command line interface is a bit slow. Um, it's easier to go through here and just check big boxes and make them all go away. Um, so, all right, so let's move on here. All right, so is there any, Oh, okay, so I guess um, what we're going to do now is we're going to enhance CentOS 7. Uh, like this. So we are in simple. Okay, here we have a Docker file. It's simple. I mean, it says from CentOS 7. So it says Start with CentOS 7 image that I just ran as a base. And all I'm going to do, do is I'm going to say add an environment variable called hello. And that's it. So it's kind of stupid. But okay. Dr. Bill dash T simple one. So that I'm going to tag this as a image named simple one. So when I list out my list of images, I'll see that. And then dot. Dot says well, in this case, it says, look in the current directory. Everything that possibly want in this Docker image will be available to me from here or a subdirectory of here. It is the Docker context, as it's called. And it says, so basically, when you are creating a Docker image, you have to copy everything you need into one subdirectory and run it from there. Um, you can use a Docker ignore file, which we see, which in the case, say, say later we'll be looking at building an Angular app, you don't need node modules because all you're looking for is the actual HTML, the JavaScript, whatever that's being deployed. You don't care about all other junk, so you can create what they call a Docker ignore file that says, when you're building your context, don't even grab that stuff because you don't want to grab node modules if you don't care. Um, so we just do this. So you can see, CentOS 7, and it says every time it runs a step, which is typically a line, um, it creates a new hash, a new intermediate container, and then finally we end up with this. This is the hash of the, find, the, the image ID, hash, image ID, of the final container. Um, I did not get, so this is the name of the container, uh, or, sorry, image, name of the image. I didn't assign a tag to it, so it assumes colon latest. This is like Snapshot Maven or something. It kind of tracks the most recent version. And sometimes it's safe to use, but if you're actually releasing stuff into production, it's probably not a safe thing to use. We always version everything as part of our CD pipelines, and it goes out with a number on it. And so I can always say this one. But latest works for now. So we built that image in this directory? Well, the image is in the Docker, the bar live Docker, where all the other images are. So you can see simple one, and that, so it's in it's in my Docker, uh, my other images. So if I do the same thing with simple one colon one, what's this going to do? It's going to run the same Docker file. And see what it does. So the in one interesting thing is it says using cache. So this is a key when you're building Docker files is you want to do it in the right order. You want to do the stuff that doesn't change first because what the Docker daemon will do is it'll say, oh, I already saw this line, I already saw this line, I already saw this line. I'll just use the thing I have already out of cache because it's building layers, it's stacking them up. And until it finds something that's changed, it's going to say, oh, I'm just going to use it from the cache. And if you can keep your stuff that changes for the last two or three lines of the Docker file, you've just got a huge amount of speed. 
So now I've, I've done a Docker image, the second one. So latest was the first one we built. Uh, one is the second one. But notice they have the same image ID. It's because the contents are identical. They're just tagged differently. I can do Docker tag bread HC. Wrong order. Source destination thread. So I just tagged it with a name. It's the same ID. It doesn't matter. I can Docker run Fred. Oh, do that. Docker run. You made a copy of it. No, there's no cop. It's we're all referring to the same image. They're just it's like Git tag. You know, the, the commit's the same. The SHA for the commit's the same, but it's it's, it's a different. You know, the label's different. It's, it, uh, there's no new stuff. So let's run Fred, which is really our simple one. Dash. So remember, this is a CentOS image at, in its heart. And so when we run this, it'll basically be running what we saw, which was the CentOS uh, OS. So here we are. Can, let's see if it can't release. Blah. OK, now, what, what was different about the stock CentOS versus New one. Environment, environment variable. variable, right. So what do we got? Hello from CentOS. <laughs> so when you oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you said about having the common things at the top and then the unique things at the bottom so that you can optimize, are you referring to different Docker files? Uh, kind of across different file lot Docker files or, or like is that within but with different runs based on the inputs or something like that? So um, I get this, this is a bad Docker file to even explain with because it's only two lines. Um, so let's go look at a perhaps a more interesting one. So here's, a, here's one that builds um, one of the Docker applications that we'll be looking at. Um, so I define where I'm starting with. So in this case, I'm starting out with a node 8, 9 image. I'm bragging. Then I say, um, create me a directory in this image called sl slash app. Um, I'm going to set this as my current working directory. So anytime I copy something to dot, it becomes slash app. Sometimes you don't need that. Like here, I'm using the explicit. Uh, although the work there, when you start the container, that's the default directory. So that is kind of important if you want to just go in and do something as opposed to having to CD here all the time. Um, I'm going to add a bunch of files and I'm going to copy them into the app directory. I'm going to run NPM in production mode so I don't get all the dev dependencies. So. When this, so something to keep in track of is that I don't need a node installed in my box in order to make this work. Because I'm already in a Debian image that's got node 8.9. whatever installed. And it's, it's in my path. I have everything set up for me to just run a node. So I can npm i production. I'm, and I'm assuming that. All the files that I want to put into this thing are sitting in my Docker context. So I have a directory which you can see right here. Um, this was which one? server, right? So here's the server directory. I don't know if you can see that, but here's the stuff that's in my Docker context. So package JSON, package block, server. They all get copied into app. Here's my Docker ignore file. Remember we were talking about that. So bunch of stuff that I don't even have, but you know, this is like a generic one for stuff you don't generally don't want. Um, but then there's this views directory, so I better uh, copy that too. Um, so now I have all the files I need. So going back to the order, NPM production takes a minute or two. So it's slow. So if I put this as the well, of course, I need package JSON too. And, and typically, images won't be this e simple. There's usually permissions that have to be tweaked. And, but, you know, this will work. Um, but if I say 
this is the first line, and then I do a yum install something, and then something else, and then something else. I don't, I don't want to do it. If all I'm doing is changing a dependency, maybe I don't want to do that every time. So I put that before I include my other things. So if the system says, hey, you know, the Docker context from the previous run is identical to this one, I'm not even going to run NPM I. I'm just going to skip it and use the layer that we built the last time. Same with the views. If none of the views have changed, I'm just going to use a layer. But as soon as one of those breaks, it it fails and it says, "Okay, we got to start. We got to start building things for real." I see. So within the Docker file itself, the uh, reruns of it, if things uh, the things that don't change very frequently, if you have those at the top, it just keeps those. It essentially just like Git, it just keeps pointing to that hash before any in that chain of breaks. Yep. So I think it'll do all the work. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. It's yeah. keeping intermediate versions of the image in that build directory somewhere. Well, it, it, they're all all the intermediate copies are in the you know, bar live Docker, the cache, whatever that thing we look at when we look at huh. the uh, when we do Docker images. So each one of these has a whole gob of layers associated with it. So this is just another. There's another or more layers that are shoved in there, and um, if they if they can be used, they're used, and if not, new ones are built and then added. So, what was a question there? Oh, uh, what's the difference between add a copy and the Docker file? Uh, let's see. Copy allows you to copy files, and you can do multiples into a single destination. Add allows you to do magic stuff like adding a tar gene Z or something like that, and it'll explode it out into where the destination is. So there's they're basically the same thing except there's subtle differences and you gotta be careful of trailing slashes because then things don't work. I mean it's kind of weird, but, uh, but that's they're both just taking stuff out of your Docker context and moving it into the container or moving it into the image. Okay. And copying. Anything else? So, yeah, so one more question. Since yeah. the, isn't Docker keeps the history of all the versions as well as the, like if you didn't do it in an optimal way, like you'd have a, it, it would, for each version, it would be rebuilding all, the whole thing, I'd say, right? Mm -hmm. um, does that result in like bloat or associated with that uh, image? There, there are the image fragments that aren't associated with the, uh, so the, the layers that aren't associated with other images are typically, they get rid of them. But the, um, wouldn't be able to, it probably just keeps them all, and then. You can continue to launch any layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably just keeps them all, and then you get to clean them up. Yeah, um, so it, once you, I, I imagine that you can remove versions, older versions if you wanted to do that, and after that it would be able to free to, but don't, yeah, so I mean every time I run this, if I run if I run that again and change something, so it, it blows away the one layer and then caches it, um, that so that let's see. What kind of kind of matters to you for like yeah. if you're sharing images with other people, right? Right. So you're uploading yeah. images, so if you haven't done a good job caching the upload is bigger and other people downloading and installing that image are going to have more data to download as well. Right. I've never seen, I've never, well, for one thing, Docker Images only shows the one that are available for you to run. You know, so there may be a whole gob of them underneath there somewhere. We've never had to manually, and then, you know, but if we use a portainer and we go look at, you know, here's, here's our images. Um, these are all the ones that are tagged. I mean, there's a few of them because we built some things, but um, you know, there's only a couple of these ones at the end that are unused. But these are six. You know, these are big ones that were probably built. So there's no slush bucket of little layers that are sitting around here. Docker images dash dash all lists a whole bunch without names. So oh, I'm not smart sure guy those, back here. I don't know if those are the ones. <laughs> that could be. Yeah, and then uh, all those ones. Yeah, so these are probably, well, they might be end. Mm. 
My guess is, yeah, my guess is they're still laying around somewhere. And if you do the Docker prune commands, that gets rid of stuff that's not currently being used, and it's a pretty easy way of cleaning it up. Is there a way to display the, the tree so you can see the hierarchy of uh, this image was built? I, I, think, I think you can. I, think, I don't remember the command. Yeah. I think you can maybe inspect the image. Well, it has a section that lists what the layers are that comprise it. So if you do, so that's a good thought. Um, so let's docker inspect um, E93, that's the CentOS 7. So this says, give me information about this guy, and this comes out in the JSON format. Um, so here's information about, uh, you know, does it have a terminal, your path, this is the command that it'll run when it starts up. Um, it, if I don't override it with something else, like looks like bashed in there. Um, but, you know, labels what Docker was used to build it. Um, There's something at the top that says what image. Uh, root fs. Yeah, I think if you go, up, there's an image uh, there. Tells you what the image is, but can Well, this is the shot for the, the ID for the container. Or is it this one? <coughs> no, it says parent is blind to comment. Yeah. Yeah. Or was, the, was this a CentOS 7? <laughs> this is a CentOS 7 one, yeah. Here's your image tag. Yeah, like try to inspect the image, not the container. And this was. I was looking at images. Yeah, I mean, this is an image, but maybe it's linking to the container that's running. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so here is an interesting tidbit. So the var live docker is where all your files are stored for your images. Um, every container has their own subdirectory, which is indexed, I think, by some hash that says Files that you can see inside the container that are not part of the image are, are here. So, for example, when, when you're running these containers on a server, FluentD will sit and scrape the var live docker tree looking for standard out files, and it'll track all those standard out files, and that's how it collects logging output to send to uh, something like the Kibana or something. Uh, okay. Well, here it looks like it does list the layers. I think I think the center last image just had the single view yeah. for the file. Yeah, so it was probably a root image, so it didn't have a parent. But in this is like see your root fs. So if you did the inspect on the one you just built, it might tell you what to go where it went from. Yes, there's your parent. Yeah. Okay. So somebody's got to know that information. So it looks like it's image. All right. So let's move. We spent enough time there. Um, so we can do the same thing with, we did that. So if you go into a, a Jesse based container, so it's a Debian, it'll be using app get instead of yum. Right, so there's system differences. Um, you don't have a lot of control over things like system D. You know, you can't like set up. You might be. Able, I don't know if you know if you can set up cron jobs and stuff to run inside it, but it's kind of limited. It's not a real OS. It's it's the veneer of an OS, but with common things like your host file and DNS and that kind of stuff. All right, so. Um, one of the most interesting things that I like is being able to just run stuff and have it running in your box and not have to worry about installing it. Um, the thing I like even better is you can install stuff and not worry about it screwing up your computer. So let's run this. So this is um, 
I, I briefly entertained the idea of using this as our node repository for, um, it's a uh, Nexus 3, it's a repository for NPM, for Docker images, for all kinds of stuff, and this is the open source uh, version of it. Uh, so 703, Docker, logs, 703. Okay, so let's do 703 dash F. So this guy's starting up. Uh oh, look at this. Errors, errors, errors. Oh, good grief. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that you might expect. Um, the problem is that this this Nexus data temp is being written into an area of the disk that's marked as um, no exact. <coughs> and so there's a issue with these things running like that. That's why I put uh oh there. I know it's not going to work. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, change my user because now if I change my user to 1000, 1000, I might have permission to write to that location because I, I have permission to write there. Let's try that. After. So first, um, yeah, let's try it. Oh, okay. Notice that I gave it the name Nexus, and I tried to run another container, another command line with the same name. It said, no, I can't do that. Docker RM Nexus. You're going to see me do that about 20 times tonight. Oh, you cannot remove it. So even though it's not working, it's still dead. It's still there. So I'm going to force it to stop and then remove it. Now there's no container named Nexus. Now we're going to run it again. Docker logs. OK, so the log, I look at the hash and then dash F. <coughs> that even worked worse. OK, Docker RM Nexus. So notice that it didn't complain that the, the container was running, so it must have died completely. Um, so let's go, uh-oh. So now we get into volume mapping. So this, on var live docker, I have a extra piece of storage in, and it's marked as no exec because in general, I don't want anybody to write, run anything on it. Um, it probably wasn't a great choice because it causes problems like this, but, gives us a chance to explore this. So I'm going to say run. So the dash u says run with this user context, user ID 1000, group ID 1000. Dash d says run as a daemon. Dash p says port 8081 inside the container can be seen from the outside of the container at port 8081. So in LR, it follows uh, microservice containers. They're all port 88. Now, obviously, you can't run everything on the same host on port 8080. They all have different IP addresses. It doesn't really matter anyway, but that's a technicality. But if I was to try, we have a, a thing that deploys this system to our testers boxes with uh, an Ansible script. And they need different ports. And so we're able to just say, hey, port 8080, turn it into port 8001. 8, or this 8080 on container 2, turn it into 8002. And so you can do, you can map ports around at will here. There's no fancy, I mean, and the inside of the container doesn't change. You don't have to modify a configuration file or anything. The container says, I'm running on port 8081. The guy outside says, I'm listening, or I'm connecting to you on port 8080, and Docker does the mapping and the, the communication. This is all that C group stuff. Now here's another thing. This volume map. So this says, hey, stuff inside. So I have a directory called Projects Nexus Data. Map that to the Nexus Data directory inside the container. So this is how I can persist my, uh, so when I, when I add stuff to my repository, I don't want it to go away the next time I update the, to the next version of Nexus. Um, so this is how I will do that. So Start that. OK. 
Okay. So there's um, this is one container that's out there. If you go on Docker Hub, there's zillions of them. I mean Jenkins, you can run Jenkins as a container, you can run Artifactory, any 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 kind of development, go use you know, go C D, there's any kind of development system that you want is probably out there now and you can just do Docker run blah. If you don't have it, it'll pull it. Um, so in certain cases you have to give it parameters and like here you, have to, you might have to play with it a little bit. But now, um, so it said I, it was listening in 8081, right? So let's do this, welcome Nexus. Okay, look at that. So no installation, no configuration. <coughs> Except a little magic in the command line just to give it some place to live. And I say, you know, I'm going to switch from this to Artifactory. I'm going to make everything go away. I just disconnect, you know, shut down the uh, container, delete it, it's gone. Delete the data, it's gone. You know, there's no, I don't have to un try to yum and remove, but oh, it installed this extra library and no, oh, now I got to, what do I do with that? So, that's a huge um, benefit, I think, of running things in containers is they don't contaminate your system. Okay, so what do we got running here? We'll kill Nexus. All righty, so on to the next one. Are there any images and things that are accepting licenses or anything like that? Like, how's that? Oh, happen? yeah. Well, I, even I mean, this one you can buy a licensed version. I mean, there's usually free versions of stuff, and it might be missing certain things, but for the most part, they're usable. So, you just but I, like in the accepting of the license, right? Like, if you get a get a Docker image, yeah. But like, are there you know, like if it has some tool within there that it's providing. Um, or I mean, before you can use it, you have to accept the licensing agreement or something like that, right? Um, that that, that step. I don't know. I've never run into that. I'm sure it can be done. In you know, usually it, the, the image starts up, the container runs. You go into the application and says, "Oh, enter your API key." So then it configures it at runtime and then stores it into the file space of the container, which means, of course, that stops it all need to be re-added or something yeah, else, unless you do something persistent. But so it's more conducive for things that are non-interactive, obviously, right? Like things that will automatically configure it provided the parameter that you give it. Yeah, and right. you can you can give it um, I can map files into the you know configuration files. I mean, that's how we do some of our right. things. We map a configuration have a configuration file that's installed on the outside into a known it's spot, there. and then the volume mapping says, hey, look here for that configuration. Right, like a license or something that it might be. Yeah. 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 yeah, and actually in um, Kubernetes and OpenShift, there's this concept of secrets and that kind of thing that you can share with different, uh, with different running containers. So you take that and kind of extend it. All right, so what do we got here? So we're going to build a little Node app. And in the instructions to start it up, that's probably really small, but it says make sure you install Node 8.9 or higher. So what are my options? I can do Amazon. Jeez. So during the break, uh, somebody asks, well, what, what can I run? Can I run databases? There are containers for Postgres, for MySQL. Um, there's actually a container for SQL Server. God knows why you want to use it, but um, but that that's in the Windows containers. Um, we'll be actually working with a Mongo one today. So yes, you can. You have to persist the data just like we did with that with the Nexus thing by map, mapping volumes into your inside to outside. So that's how you fix. That's how you get databases to work. But then a run container version one. When version two comes out, I just run the new one and the same data. It upgrades itself. Boom, I got a new, a new system. 
<laughs> so, all right, so what are my options for running Node? Well, I can say I got a couple of, I, I have version six, that's what all my apps are on, but now I gotta use this new stuff and it needs invert Node 8, and so I gotta, uh, I gotta yum remove or yum uninstall or whatever it is, and then reinstall the right version or I guess I could just say, oh, well, put it off in the corner somewhere and or do a special RPM thingy or whatever. And NVM actually works pretty well, but so we use that a lot. But you, know, you still got to run it and set it up. And so, eh, maybe we could just do something different. Um, oh, and then, so that's, that's the first step of the question. The next one is, all right, now I'm going to install this Angular stuff. If I have an older version of Node, uh, is it going to have the right, is it compatible? So, is it, if I, if I, if that requires a nine and I have a six in my box, is, is it even going to work? So, what's really nice is being able to um, isolate your tools into a container. And so, we do this currently in our build pipelines with, um, we found that a certain, the Chrome, for this is the best example I've ever found of this. Um, Jenkins supports using containers out of the box uh, for a build environment. What we, we have uh, tests that are running and they're using uh, Chrome, the headless Chrome is a, uh, you know, since uh, the other one kind of died, uh, everybody's using headless Chrome now. Inside the container was an issue with some sort of libraries that weren't installed and we didn't want to have to install that on our 10 different build boxes. So what we did is we just changed the image de definition, added yum this and a yum that and ran it and now we have those libraries are installed in that image and now we use that to build, that, that actually gets run when it, gets, when it builds code. And now the dependencies are there, the libraries are there but we didn't have to sit and mess around with the box. And in some of these boxes, there's CentOS 7, CentOS 6, there's different versions of 7. So if you've ever messed with Linux uh, library dependencies, you know that's not a fun time. And this just completely eliminates that problem. So let's play around with this guy here. All right, um, one yeah. other question about that. Are you saying that you didn't have to rebuild those uh, those images? Uh, that you, the you, base one, or you did so rebuild you, those? You have, a, you have an image, and now we say, okay, I'm gonna add a couple more lines to the Docker file, which do yum add this, and yum do this, and then now I have a new image, and it's got those things baked into it. So now I tell the build system, hey, don't use this version of the builder, use this. Yeah. And then now it pulls in that new one, and now it's got all the new libraries, and Chrome starts up, and, every, and the test pass, and everybody's happy. Got it. So if you had one image that was like, let's say, the base one, and then you had other images that were using from that other mm -hmm. base one, when you update your base one, you're, you'd have to trigger a rebuild of all the child images, right? Correct. Yeah, the base, the base one, the base one changes. Yeah, and, and so. If it's referred to by name and version, then typically, ideally, that doesn't change, right? Um, OpenShift tends to do some magic where they say, you know, if you're using a JBoss container as your base image, and you're running it in our system, and there's a security update, it will get slid in automatically. And we just go, ah, I don't <laughs> want that. Um, but that's something they're promoting, because they can just slide that layer in while they're loading the thing. That's a special, we don't, we don't even use that feature. Um, okay. All right. What the heck happened here? Uh, oh, yeah, we forgot that some didn't tell it to do anything. I think it drops you into a uh, uh, node executable. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, what's the name? Nodi. There we go again. Okay, now we'll do bash. Okay, so um, here we are. We're in, a, we're in a bash shell or inside a node 8, 9. So if I do node dash v, okay, I get 8, 9, and 4. If I do npm dash v, not v, v. 
Yes, thank you. Okay, five-ish, so we're good. Um, I have a node thing. I can do npm install, except on what? <laughs> There's nothing here. What do I do? Um, so I have to get my source code into the container. So how do I do that? Docker ps. Okay, let's first let's kill. Do a little house cleaning here. Kill Fred. These days I'll learn how to type. <coughs> Two, four. How about that one? Um, so let's go back to our cheat sheet here. So this is this is what I want to do inside this container. I want to add TypeScript and I want to add Angular CLI. And so um, we're going to do that. So what I need to do though is well, actually, you know what? I don't even need to do that. So let's see. I don't care about code because we're just building a builder image at this point. So let's do. Because we're installing dash g, so there's no package JSON, no effect. I'm, I'm installing it in the global. And so remember, if you're doing it on your local box, you generally have to sudo it unless you have it in NVM or something that goes to your local directory. Um, I don't have to worry about that, so we're going to do, we'll be installing TypeScript. One of the things I wanted to demonstrate was using that other container as the our NPM repository, just in case our internet went down, but didn't get to it. Okay, so it installed. So now I got TSC running. Okay, and I'm inside the container. And then let's grab that guy. Oh, Ooh. In presentation mode. I think it's telling me. So um, this is installing the package globally. Remember, I'm root. You can see my username there. So I'm running as root. So I have I can do things like install sg without doing anything special. You're doing this inside the container. This is inside the container. But you could just as easily add it to your build script or to a build script. You could um, put it in a Docker file. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll actually do that. I have, and we'll see that. Um, but it's really not much different than what I'm doing here. So I've got a container that's running. It's got the Angular ng tool now installed. Um, it's got Node, so this is like this is good. This is all I need. So let's get out of here. Um, Docker. So it's the next line. So we're going to use a, uh, a line called or a command called um, commit. So this is. Roughly like a commit and git or something, saying, "Okay, here's you got this changed container. I'm gonna kind of squish it into an image. So I'm I'm unclassifying, un uninflating the class. Right? So commit to a. Is it making a new image or is it updating the existing one that you started it's, from? It's taking it's making a new one. Um, so it's taking the layers that we said. Remember when I started the thing? I said it's this is. Uh, using the node 8 and 9, so that would be at the bottom layer, and then the new stuff that I've added in uh, has been smashed into another layer, and now I have probably two layers. But you're making a new one, you're not, new you're not so, screwing up the old one. So, it, no, not at all. Okay. Um, so now I got a new shop B4C, so if I do Docker Images, um, so at the top we have this B4C image. Um, it's very ugly, so I'm going to do docker tag e4c. I'm going to call it um, ang, ang dev6 because it's Angular 6. Okay, so if I do docker images again. Alright, so what can I do with this guy now? I can just run it, right? So I can do docker dash no, run. Dash it um, ang dev six one colon one tag of the colon and let's just bash 
So this is a new, new image I've just created. What should I be able to do now that I'm in it? And G. It worked, good. Okay, <laughs> so, and then TSC, right? Because those are the two packages that we installed. So I have a global, uh, global installations of these packages, and I have Node, so I'm good. Now let's do some other good stuff. So does, does commit basically just take a container and make it into an image? Yeah. Okay, that's exactly it was a running container. It, well, the container by definition it had to run once. Otherwise, it's just an image. So yes, you have the squash. So that original container that you added a uh, node in, in TypeScript to, mm -hmm. uh, if you shut that down, those things that you added will go away, uh, right? Uh, from the original. The or you don't. You you took you took your node image. Yeah. Actually, your node image brought up a container, did some things with it. Right. Committed it to create a new image. Mm -hmm. If we shut the original container down, yes, it still leaves the original. Um, so if note. I so if I remove the container, it will delete that container. I mean, it just goes okay. away. Um, the image will remain because it's still an image, and it's right. You just brought it to life and did some stuff. Yeah. Too, yeah. Although I might I might say that perhaps it's. Uh, Perhaps the layers will be the same. I mean, that's, that container probably had the same file layers as the the image, or just different. Um, so, so Dave, maybe put it another way. Yeah. You went in, you ran those those two npm install commands. Yep. And on on an existing <coughs> started up the container, ran those two on npm. You stop that container. You go, then you start it back up later. Those those things are gone. No, if I, so I have a, de a stopped container here. So the, um, that was the... Two A8, you mean no? Without, without it, I'm yeah, saying two A8, yeah. yeah. Docker... To create an image. Start two A8. As long as he serves the container, you understand that. If he tries to restart the original thing, and he makes a container out of the original image. Right, he's not changed yet. So, exactly original image. so I just restarted the original container that I stopped in order to commit it. I restarted it. It's the same container as it was. It has the ng in it. It's node with ng. Mm -hmm. Same thing. The only difference that I did is that when I did the commit, that kind of took that and repackaged it as an image. Okay. So, so now I have an image that will always remain until I delete it. But, and, but the container, I can do... And you could use Doctor. it in a later from now that you've committed that. Whereas you could you, you couldn't do that with just a running with just until you did that. You you can't do the, from a container, you have to do from an yes. image. Yes. Right. Why would you do it this way versus like wouldn't you normally want to just add these in a Docker file or some other repeatable? Well sure, but that would be easy. <laughs> you can't do this, but you, show you how good using it. Well, you know, you don't get to make mistakes and show people how stuff works if you just sit. Okay, Docker file. Next question. I mean, it's got to be a real world use case for this, right? Um, so understanding. I mean, that's it that way. Though. You, you lose take control of what easier version of your monitor actually is. See whether the command that you're going to get is failing. So you prove it out, and then you bring your people. At least that. So Smarty Pants back there brings up a good point that you can just do this and you'd be done, right? You say from node 8 and 9, because that's what we did when we started up. Um, install TypeScript, install Angular CLI, and really if you're really into like optimizing, if you're really into optimizing um, your Docker files, you can do something like this. Because every run, every command causes another layer, it has a potential to cause another layer. If you look at most big Docker, you know, commercial Docker files or ones in the big projects, they have line, you know, thousand lines of and or double ampersands. Because the more stuff you string together, the more stuff it crams into one layer. Because the layer is what costs you money, so you make you put as much stuff into it as you can. 
that has the downside is that if you have a line of a thousand things and one of those changes, now you're, you have to rebuild everything, right? So it's this kind of a balancing act between how, how often does stuff change versus how big does it make it there. Another interesting thing that I discovered when trying to containerize Java applications is we had to change the permissions on a jar file once, and it's like a, it's like a 300 meg jar file. It builds a second layer with a 300 meg jar file in it with a different permission. And so that's part of the image. It's really not efficient. You'd think they could just say, eh, we'll just change the permissions and put the new one in. No, it's a brand new layer with that whole file. Even if you ampersand if you end it together? Uh, Oh, but you do so you, add, you, you have to add, do a zoom add, 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 right? Course. And then you, yeah, you and what add, they add. don't have is they don't have a way of affecting the permissions on the way in. Okay. If they just said add with this, you know, RWX or whatever, that would be beautiful because then I wouldn't have to worry about any of this stuff. Um, there, so just so you know, there are some Docker squash programs, and what they'll do is you can say, take this 20 layer image and compress everything, like the first two leave them and everything else, pr compress them into a single. So it's kind of like uh, squashing a rebase, right? Everything gets mashed into one commit. And so now you have three layers instead of 20. And that's nice as long as, in, it, in my, the case of my jar file, it would reduce the size of the image completely because it's got only one copy of the stupid jar file in that two or three or whatever. So. There are tools that are available like that that are not official. Um, I think Docker is supposed to have some sort of feature like that because it seems pretty useful to me. So anyway, so here is the um, file. Let's prove that this worked. Oh, let's see, where are we? Oh, we're in server. Oh, Okay, so docker build dash t dev. So let's do an experiment. We'll see if, um, what do I call the other one? Angdev 6.1. Let's call this angdev 6 uh, df for docker file called dot. So the current directory, which has just got three files in it, let's Docker file, let's go. Is there a way to go from a Docker image back to a Docker file? I thought I read about that somewhere. Maybe. It'd be good homework for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, you would think that they would do that internally somewhere. All right, so we have a 899 image, um, docker images, let's go to this guy, it's a little bigger. All right, so what do we do? So the size is the same, not surprising since it's the same code basically. Um, you know, maybe subtly different that we're not seeing here, surrounding the, the nearest megabyte. Um, so the image ID is different. So that probably means the contents are slightly different. Um, either one of these will work though, because they're both doing the same thing. So if I do docker run uh, dash t 899 dash, it better have ng in it, and it better have tsc in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's that. So so we have a builder uh, builder container. How do we do something useful with this? Okay, so I have a server app here. <coughs> Let's start building this. So my server code is located in this directory. So I'm going to, oh, let's see. Let me do that. Okay, so what we're going to do is, this is going to run a server that runs on port um, 3000. It's a node express application. So we need to expose, expose port 3000 to the outside world. So let's do that first, dash P 3000. 
Okay, then I need to be able to see source code, or I'm not going to get much done here. So dash v. So uh, inside or outside the inside. So outside the container is this. That colon inside the container is server. So inside the container, we're going to see server. The server directory will have my source code. Um, anything else we need? I don't think so. Oh, yeah, we need a, um, what's, what's the name of the image I'm going to run? So let's do, what is the num that name? AIMDEV6. Yeah, either one of them should work, so 6, one. Okay, so now we have our options. We're using the console. We're doing the bash. Let's go. Oh, no. Oops. We did a run on it. It had an 899 image. Oh, good. Yeah, I started typing in the wrong place. Okay, let's try it again. Oh, port is already allocated. Okay, who's running on port 3000? Uh, hmm. He is. I like that. Docker RM. Okay, here we go again. All right, now, inside the container. Post name. Post name, okay. And then inside the container, server. Here's my files, look at this. So I can do, um, oh, oh no, <laughs> what are we gonna do now? So. One thing that Docker containers do is they try to be as stripped down as they can. So especially stuff like Nginx is the worst. It's got nothing. It doesn't have IP config. It doesn't have anything. In it. You got, typically you have to install a tool in the network next to it in order to be able to do stuff. So, or you can copy, binary, copy binaries from the outside into the running container <laughs> to try to, to get tools in there so you can do work. So this base image doesn't have, it probably has IP adder, yeah, so that's, that's usually in there. So I guess this is a good time to talk about the network too. Um, you see this container that's running has the, it's been assigned the IP address of 172.17.0.2. Um, when these containers get started up, they get plugged into a little uh, network by default, I think it's called Bridge. And each one is a, it's a NAT, so each one is assigned one of those special non-routable IP addresses within the cluster of, of Docker containers. And so this, the O.1 is the gateway, that's where everything goes when you're talking out of this, out of the Docker system. Um, O.2 is the first Docker container that's been hooked up in this network, so now in the next one will probably be O.3. Surprising. Okay, so, uh, let's see, what do they do here? Um, so we got no VI, well, let's see, it'll just cat package JSON. Let's see. So it's got that at least. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run that because we want to start the server, but I wanna run it in Node, with Nodemon so it'll pick up changes that I make. So npm run dev. Hmm. I'm expecting to see a, a talk, you know, connecting in port 3000. Oh, and then I remember, this talks to MongoDB. Oh boy. Okay, well, that's, it's not gonna work so good without a MongoDB. So, boom, need Mongo. Okay, so this app does quotes ostensibly Star Wars quotes, but who knows. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, for you database people, we're just gonna run Mongo here. Um, this is inside the container. Let's go to the yellow screen, which I think disappeared. Okay. So we have a Mongo running at port 27017. Oh, now I noticed that I didn't do the uh, port on it, but it kind of looks like it should work. So let's see if we do curl, um, 
local host call me 270117 it should give us the message saying you're an idiot all right um, <laughs> so by there's that exposed port or the port exposed in there in the docker files I think we saw that in, well maybe we haven't seen it yet you can say hey you know I I'm useless without this port open. I'm going to just tell you to expose it, and it looks like it's there automatically. So we don't have to. That's okay. What if you want to change that? I can change that to whatever I want. If I want to change, I can map that to port 8080 if I want on the outside. But I'm just going to leave that as the default. So um, now here we get to do some magic. Um, we have Mongo running. So let's go over here. Okay, we'll connect. Looks like a Mongo database. We'll create a database called quotes. <coughs> we'll do quotes collection. Okay. And then we'll do a. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna add code. I'm gonna add stuff here, and then if I stop the container, it's gonna go away. Right here. Uh, yeah. Oh. Right. Mm. So there's a lot of lot of parts. Okay. So I don't know where the um, data files are stored in Mongo. So I can go into the container and then you can say mount. And oh, it's right there. Now I remember. And actually, if you go to the, um, the here's the Docker store. If I go to Mongo here. It actually has pretty good documentation saying oh, if you want to do all this stuff, if you want to use custom configurations, where to store data. Here's a good one there. Man, directory visible. Blah, blah. So here's two mounts that we can use. So this is basically what we're going to do is we're going to say dash v that. So um, Docker PS. Let's kill the Mongo. Uh, two eight four. Okay, um, you get real used to just killing stuff. I mean, just throw it away. It doesn't matter. You know, it's not like uninstalling service. I mean, you just throw it away and it's done. Docker. Okay, run. Here we go. Huh, look at that. I must have had that for left open last time. Okay, so name Mongo. So that's the name of the container that's <coughs> running. We'll run it as a daemon, not as an interactive sh shelly thing. We're going to map two uh, data structures, one of them into my local Mongo, da Mongo database and one into my local config DB. We're going to expose the port even though we don't care, and this is the name of the image. So let's run that. So let's go back to our Mongo. Let's see if they can. Go to local, connect. Oh, look at this. Now we have a quotes database. Ah, okay. So it's got data in it. So now, I've, so this is data that's been persisted from a previous session. I just connected the, the directories from the inside or from the outside to the inside, and then Mongo comes up and says, hey, I know that. It's data. And it uses it. Um, you can set up configuration in a Docker file. Say, use Mongo, put all these files in, put SS, uh, like SSL certificates in, put this and that in, and bake it into a container. And now I got all that stuff in there, and it'll never break because it, I'm assuming it works to begin. Um, okay, so now we have a we have a. Um, Our application that was not running well. Okay, so now we have a Mongo database, and so now that hopefully this thing will work. Yeah, or not. Okay, 
So, um, one of the requirements here is that we can talk to Mongo. So, remember I showed you the. Um, no, yeah, I can't show you that. So I, you you need to show it. ping? Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Resolve. No, it's a little jump. So let's see if we can ping Mongo. Ping Mongo. Okay, unknown host. So let's stop this container and restart. Um, what I want to be able to do is talk through that backend network to Mongo. Okay. Ping Mongo. Okay, what I forgot was you have to say, I want to talk to Mongo. Link Mongo. Otherwise, remember, containers are isolated by default. And that's, that's kind of what makes them good, is I don't want to be, you be screwing around with any of my stuff. Um, in our OpenShift installation, we have you know, about 100 containers in there. We don't want team A being able to mess up team B. So they, everybody has permissions anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, all right, so now we'll say ping mongo. Hey, look at that. So remember, our IP address in one container was two, here this one's four. Um, now, one thing to notice is remember that mongo, I mean, there's, basically there's a DNS entry in here now. Is it DNS or is it BTC slash hosts? Well, it could be either. Eh, look at that. It's so it's in the host. But it's an entry. So that got stuffed in there automatically by the whole network. Um, so you know, that from the link? Yeah. 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 Okay. And you also have the host names, which is the container IDs showing up here too. So I can also say um, in that. So now, maybe our code will actually work. Because now it should be able to talk out to that. Um, OK, I'm not going to get that. Uh, let's see, npm run. OK, so one other thing. Export. Mongo URL <coughs> equals. The underscores are really weird. Um, let's see, yeah, space my name. No, it's not a space, it's an underscore. Which, yeah, I don't get it. But, okay, Mongo. So, here's another thing that gets really useful when you have a lot of containers running is everybody's got a name and, it's, and you can point to it by name. So, if I can define my container names, I can just talk to that one. So, I don't have to go hunting around for. Um, what, what IP address are you? Although, let's look at our environment. You didn't export it. Before. Yeah, I, I know. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wanted to bail on it. Um, but look at the, because we connected to the Mongo uh, link, you have all these environment variables available here which say, hey, there's a container that, a link thing, a link container no Mongo called Mongo that I know stuff about that you wanted to know about because you're linked. And so it exports automatically all these, um, you know, the name of the container, the ports, uh, whatever. So if I had my application could probably just read the value of one of these environment variables and then use that to configure the route to the, um, the route to Mongo. So let's Fix that export. We should have just done that anyway. Okay, so now we do npm on def. You better start. Ah! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought I had a default value for port, but I guess not. Port equals 3000. The beauty of this is that. Ah, oh, jeez. Some Mongo Yeah, it's Mongo is broken. Oh, yeah, you know what? Let's try that again. Oh, okay. 
Anybody want to bet if it works or no? This is it worked all day today. I'm sure it won't work now. Oh, wait, look at that. All day. There's no chance it's going to work now. So, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, chewy. Our, let's go back to our database. We got data in there now. And now if I hit my rest endpoint quotes, I get the JSON version of all the data. So this is now running inside here, and you can see the log coming out here. Um, I can go into my code and I can edit the view. Let's see. And better pick up a change. Yeah, well, the work before. Let's see. Hey, look at that. So, you know, the, the node mon thing is rebuilding and things change. I mean, this is just like you're developing in a local box, but I don't need a node install. So, this is, you know, maybe for desktop development, a bit much, but if you have more than two modules to install globally or you have weird stuff, this isolates. I mean, basically, I'm, I can just work in my IDE most of the time. Then there might be interesting problems with, you know, say Node, usually you have all this breakpoint stuff. And then, uh, does that work here? Yeah, maybe not. So this is, it's a tool that's available. Um, where we find it super valuable, though, is in like Jenkins builds continuous integration to bake different sets of tools into containers. Um, so it's eight ten. So I have one more piece of this. I don't, you know, it's just basically an Angular app that connects to this endpoint, and it's kind of the same thing, but it uses the same container. Um, so I don't know. It's that super useful. So let's go back to the so keep everybody all there. I could talk for hours. Let's see, anything here that we um, care about? Oh, so yeah, actually there is something that's kind of fun. So one of the things that's uh, nice with these is I can say, okay, I got I got everything working, now I can bake these all in my containers. Um, serve, blah, blah, blah. Um, I can, so I basically build, so let's go into here. Uh, let's see. So now I'm in the, let's go into the server. I have a Docker file here. Server Docker file, which I think you looked at before. Um, yeah, which actually I think we run ran it before. I remember the name of Docker. Build HT server. Well, it looks like it was cached. Because it just skipped right over NPMI production for the win. All right, so we have DAC server one. Um, let's go to client. We have a Docker file here. So this is roughly, oh, so this is a little bit different. So this is assuming that there is a, this is a, um, an Angular app. It's assuming the code is living in the dist folder, which is dist client. Um, bunch of stuff that gets built by the ng build command. And it's going to copy stuff from here into there. And I think I see why it didn't work before, because it puts in a subdirectory called client, which is not what I want. Because I want the root of the nginx to be at dist. So, what do you think we're going to do? Copy this slash 
we're going to first go into something that will actually edit. And then, This, we're going to copy this clock star. All right. CD client, Docker build, T, T. So this is uh, creating a directory that's in the Nginx thing, the Nginx directory, copying this client star, which is the code, the Apple, the stuff that's the JavaScript and stuff. Then it removes the existing configuration files because in the default Nginx container, which is a web server, by the way, I think people know that. But in case you don't, it's like the the, the that web server everybody uses. It's very small, and that's the one that's got nothing in the container. Um, and then it copies the configuration file to a private configuration file that the Nginx startup will load. And so we ran that, and so let's see, if we do, does this talk to anybody? I think it's hardwired to point to server, so let's see what happened. Um, so let's do docker run dash uh, t client colon one. Okay, so we'll just use the default launch, which is, so I guess, Nginx just starts up on port 8080. Is that both internal and external? Well, the expose 8080 will be, um, that says, yeah, that says expose 8080 internal, and then it seemed to work before, just not doing anything. Oh, so maybe I didn't, maybe I need it. Try it again. Dash P. I don't, I don't get that. Hey, look at that. Okay, so this is our Angular app is running in Nginx. Um, and it's waiting for me to push this button, which is going to fail horribly because it's talking to something that's not running at this time. Um, it's trying to talk to that quotes endpoint and the other the other service. So maybe we can go. Demo gods are smiling. Maybe we can go just start that guy. Docker images. Let's look for our server. It's that guy. So the X server. So what did we need to set? We needed to set environment variables, right? So Docker run it. Um, dash p. So the, the server exposes port 3000. P server requires an environment variable of mongo url equals mongo d colon slash slash mongo colon 277. It requires a port equals 3000. What else? Um, okay. Oh, well, the name of the image, I suppose. So, slash server colon one. And. Link. What's that? Link. Oh, yeah. Good call. Because it didn't seem to be talking to Mongo very well. So, perfect. Perfect timing. Uh, okay. On go go. <laughs> the little backspace go thing going. Okay. Listening on 3000. Drum roll, please. Ah! <laughs> All, right. All right. It's formatted beautifully. Um, this wasn't an Angular class, it was something in Docker. So I got it to work and I said it's good enough. So, how is this one communicating with the server one without this one having a link? Ah, that's a fine question. Um, this is on the host. It's just in the browser. <coughs> yes. 
So, well, no, because the the application, so we're talking to the application running at port 8080. It's turning around and making a call to server colon 3000. So we think that that wouldn't be available because we didn't actually say the link, we didn't say link with Mongo, and we didn't link it with, uh, well, no, the, yeah, server, we the server we linked with Mongo, not the right. client. Yeah, you didn't start link this one with the server. All right, so. So let's go poke inside the client and see what we can see here. So Docker Okay, so um ping on go. Do anybody know if the IP command can ping? Oh, uh, it doesn't even have that. <laughs> okay, so we're done. Um, <laughs> where's the source at in here, though? What's that? Where's the source at in this image? Is this just an Nginx image? Is that all this is? It is, yeah. Nginx with a little uh, couple of config files. Yeah. So, or, well, at, all the so in the config file, is there. Is it in there telling you how it knows how to get to the server? There, all there is is an explicit a, a name of server because I couldn't sell one thing that Angular is bad. Well, you can't you can't read environment variables from the and from the web app, right? Because it's not running in the browser. So it, the the server has to communicate configuration, and I didn't feel like doing it. So no. it, right now it's hard coded to point to. Server colon three thousand HTTP colon server three thousand. So the question still is why can I see? Let's see. But the way it's it's from the browser is hitting three thousand, right? Is that what it's no, called? it's actually a, a REST call. The the back end the back end. Oh wait, no, you're right. It's the browser. Okay. Yeah, it's an that would make more sense. Yeah, right. 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 Okay. I'm getting messed up now. It's an Angular app. It's running on the browser. It can talk. It seems. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Good question. So, um, well, now that everything's running, it's all been built in the containers. How do we make it easy to deploy? So, we have one of our one of our systems runs. Um, I think six different microservices and six different containers. We have testing people that want to run that they don't want to have to build each one and compile them. So there's different ways of um, deploying things in bulk. Um, our, our favorite tool at this point is Ansible. If you're not using that, it's a really good way of so we kind of used Ansible to, to deploy applications in containers to VMs before Doc Kubernetes was even a thing. Um, it's also uh, used pretty heavily by Red Hat and their OpenShift. It's actually they're doing upgrades and it's all big Ansible scripts. Um, so that's, and they have good support for things like Docker deploying images, running images on remote boxes. Um, so, but I do have a small sample of uh, Docker Compose here. So Docker Compose is kind of, and so you can just do, cobble together bash scripts. I can just, all those commands that I'm typing in, you can just say Docker blah and Docker blah, and it's a pain when you're shaking your head. Um, yeah, if you like scripting in bash, have at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> but right now, with, um, there's this thing called Minishift, which is basically OpenShift, the open source version baked into a VM. And if you're at all interested in playing with a Kubernetes-ish kind of thing, it's really sweet. I mean, it's just, you know, Minishift up, boom, and it does a whole bunch of, pulls a bunch of stuff, runs a VM. You have a web interface, you can run Mongo's right from the web interface. I mean, it's pretty sweet. And I actually wanted to be able to deploy one in here. We're already running pretty late, so. Um, but let's, I'll just show you the Docker Compose. This is kind of Docker's uh, attempt at um, running things in bulk. So let's go look at the file. 
So what do we got here? We have services. So this is a YAML file. Um, we have two, let's see, I think my container names were server one. Mongo colon 2717. Oh, maybe that's why this didn't work. Um, and then let's also throw in here, because we're smarter, because I failed this before. Fails, uh, 3000. Um, so this is just like the command line parameters we were using before. It's, you know, Mongo URL, environment variable, port, and then some the names of things, the name of the image, except it's just expressed in a piece of code. And links, Mongo, hey, remember that? Um, this is a piece of code that we can commit to Git and manage and copy to Jenkins and have it deploy things and do stuff. So I can hand this to a tester folk and she will grab it and run Docker Compose up and then it'll just run like a little seed. And here's Mongo, it's kind of the same deal. Uh, here's our volume mounts like we had in our command line. So let's see if this actually works. First thing I might do is shut everything down, so I think we're gonna just get a bunch of errors saying, we already have a one named that. So docker <laughs> shut. So F E C3. D9. Okay, so Dockler PS. Okay, the only thing we have running is portainer. So let's do a little composing, shall we? Um, Docker compose. Compose. Uh, up. By default, it looks for a file name docker compose.yaml. And then we're going to do dash D, which says run everything in daemon. Not so it spews logs to the console. So, if things are working, we should have two things running. And if we're really lucky, we should be able to hit port 3000 on. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, I'm, I'm missing the. Uh, my contain the views were messed up. I was afraid of that, but it's doing something. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, it's just an execution detail. So uh, you know, the, the key is here is get it out there, and then now get it into a build pipeline so you can fix stuff, and it just gets deployed out and you run it. And it's, that's that's the key. Have you used Docker for Docker images for uh, high availability? Uh, in production, like, uh, that, well, in in production in our OpenShift environment, it's all Docker containers running, and there. So typically, there's there's one microservice that's running ten pods, which is roughly a container. Um, they're high availability because if I go, I can go and kill one in production, and then it'll say, "Oh, that's not good," and it'll say, "You're supposed to have ten. You only have nine. It'll pop a new one up on an arbitrary node." Four app nodes, in the end. and so it'll pop up in one, in and then somewhere that, else. So it, it it's pretty rugged. And that's on Docker, at the Docker service. Uh, Docker is the container. So this is a so Docker is the container system, right? It's the thing that kind of binds all the C group stuff and all the Linux magic into something where we can just say Docker this, and it sets all that junk up in the network and things. So. Kubernetes, OpenShift, Mesos, all those guys, those are container orchestration systems. Those are the ones that say, that have the smarts to say, hey, you know, I, so here I can run one Docker container or two or three. But if I want to say, you know, when this guy comes up and down, I want to connect to him, I don't want to do that manually. I had to do that for one of our older systems. And even just controlling the load balancer to say, Okay, we're going to take you out of the load balancer. We're going to push a new version of a container in you. Wait till you start up. Put you back in the load balancer. Move on to the next one. That's the kind of stuff we don't want to be programming because there's a lot of variables there. What happens if it takes longer? What happens if it doesn't start? Blah blah. So these orchestration systems, you just give it essentially a state. You say, I need ten of these DAO containers running in the production cluster. 
okay. This goes and download, sends messages to all the different app nodes. They download containers from the repository, which we've put there on our continuous build pipeline. Um, sucks them all down, and then as soon as they're down, then they start running. And when the 10 of them get up and running, OpenShift says, okay, everything's cool. And it sits and pings them with health endpoints and watches for them to die or have trouble. Um, in our system, we also use Instana, which is a, a application monitoring system, because if you have a thousand containers running, it's really hard to get logs. I mean, even you can get logs because they're all centralized. They use the EFK stack, uh, and you can look at them, but there's nothing like looking at a grid with a, um, a bunch of uh, dots flowing around, and you can see, oh, this, and then seeing what's going wrong, what's not, and being able to drill into the yeah, actual requests going back and forth. And it's really important if you're at any kind of scale. But our initial deployment was just, hey, shove a container into a VM. And that was still better than having to go to the VM, load an ISO file, run that installer, and do this. And it's Is that where uh, Dr. Compose files come in, the YAML files with connecting with OpenShift? So that it knows exactly how to bring it up? So, um, no. They're stock, so the YAML files for OpenShift are YAML, but they're different. They're, they're the Kubernetes-ish YAML files, and I don't think I have one here to show. Yeah, so it knows how to pick up Docker images. No, I don't have any. This is this is my personal box. I don't have the company stuff, um, and I don't have network access. Uh, but it, there's a. If you look at the doc for OpenShift or doc for Kubernetes, there's the, the basic concepts. There are you have a cluster that runs a bunch of pods. Pods are connected by services. So the services basically the load balancing between all the running containers. And then you have routes, which is how traffic from outside gets into the cluster. And so there's a descriptor, a YAML descriptor that gets written for each one of those. And it says, okay, here, I'm gonna, this is the image you're gonna use, this is the memory resources you're gonna be limited to, this is, the, uh, uh, this is where you're gonna run, it says start up here. Um, you can say, I wanna keep one of them going and you know, I set the number of replicas, I can increase that on the fly, uh, I can do a lot of stuff. And then it, it maintains that state. And so one of our other products periodically crashes and then the ops people have to go notice that it crashes because sometimes the signaling doesn't work and they have to restart it. Well here we, they crash sometimes because another interesting thing is that Java if you say dash XMX, that's not how much memory that Java VM takes. It's a lot more than that. And if you don't change some of those numbers, so especially when you're running in a containerized system, um, you really have to be careful what your set memory settings are. You've know, been wrestling that for the last week or so. Um, so anyway. But the Compose is one way of deploying small scale. So it'd be perfect, you know, our testers can use it to deploy six containers on their desktop yeah. with a Mondo. They couldn't use it to deploy a production cluster. I, I don't think it would be good for them. Now your, uh, your, le your laptop over there, is that, is that Linux based or Windows based? Oh, it's Windows running a VM. With a you know, virtual yeah. Yeah, that's where I spend most of the day. Yeah. But, that's fine. Um, yeah. So, uh, any other questions? Have you done anything with the Hunter for Windows? I don't know if I can help it. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, I, it seems, I mean, the, the concept is really cool. So I guess if it didn't work in Windows, I, from what I understand, it's just kind of a Linux VM running fancy. There's two versions. There's, there's two different things. Yeah, yeah there's, that's Docker on Windows, but then there's Docker for Windows, which is Windows. So that must be how they're running their SQL <coughs> server and containers. So I, I don't know. I haven't looked at that. And generally, the stuff I'm working on is all 
I mean, I'd rather deploy it on Linux anyway because it's a lot cheaper. Uh, pay a Windows license for each one. The local will have on using the Docker thing, the staff or whatever. Right. And it works just like it does on the Mac, you know. Sure. Like Docker yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, just yeah, just a Linux feature. <coughs> <piece. coughs> Last time I looked for Mac, it was emulated through a VM. It's not like really sideloaded into the kernel like it's for like. But it runs. Yeah, it runs. I mean, I just did, was following along, and I had never installed Docker at all, and it just, all you know, the node stuff you're pulling down just, and it just worked. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so I would recommend install it, play with it, go up and, you know, pick something that you're interested in. Somebody was mentioning MySQL, Postgres, whatever, you can install those. Um, Nginx is out there. It's a great. You can use that as a, a reverse prop. You know, we <coughs> serve up assets like this. Little, you know, you got a bunch of little images you want to serve up. You can do that. I mean, it's the stuff is it's pretty cool, and you can kind of hook. You can get pretty complicated, especially if you got something like composed, to, so you don't have to sit there and Docker run Docker. Run. So, so I guess that would be it. Thank you very much.